Welcome everybody to our talk this afternoon by Paul Chappelle. I'm eager to introduce him, so I'm gonna give him a very quick introduction and turn it right over to him. He is a 2001 West Point graduate. He served in Iraq and left the military in 2009 as a captain. Since then, he's worked with the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation as their leadership director and has written an incredible number of books. You've been very prolific about your authorship uh, in a series called Waging Peace and others that accompany it, uh, talking about strategic peacemaking. And we're very proud and excited to be able to have him here today with all of you. So I'd encourage you to show your appreciation for Paul Chappelle. Uh, can all of you hear me? Is this microphone loud enough? Can you hear me in the back? OK. All right, I'd like to begin by talking about hope and some realistic reasons why we should be hopeful. I know hope is a very controversial thing today, so I always like to begin there. So in 1958, only 4% of Americans approved of interracial marriage between blacks and whites. Only 4%. Today, 87% of Americans approve of interracial marriage between blacks and whites. So it's gone from 4 to 87% in one human lifetime. Hang on. Is this on? It's not on. You've got a nice, strong voice. Oh. On. I'm not sure what this thing works. Right. So attitudes on interracial marriage have gone from 4 to 87 percent in one human lifetime. That's a pretty dramatic change. And I'm living proof of that change in attitude. My mother's Korean, my father's half white and half black, and I grew up in Alabama, so I'm living proof of that attitude has changed. And since I was a child, both my parents always told me. The only place in America where a black man has a fair chance is in the Army. My father was born in 1925, so he had me when he was 54 years old. He grew up under segregation in the South in Virginia during the Great Depression. And his reality was being a black man in the South before the Civil Rights Movement in the 1930s and 1940s, he had more opportunity in the military than in other sectors of American society. And that's one reason why I went to West Point and not why I went to the Army is my parents told me that because I look Asian and I'm part black, I would have limited opportunity. And so I told my mother in 2009 I was getting out of the Army, and I told her over the phone, and she was screaming at me the phone, just screaming at me. She said, are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? She said, no one's going to give you a job. No one's going to hire you. She said, it's bad enough you look Asian, but you're also part black. She said, who's going to give a job to a black man who looks Asian? So things have changed. We have a long way to go, but we've made progress. I'd much rather be part black and Asian in 2014 than in 1914 or 1814. So we have made progress. We have a lot more progress to make, but if we made some progress, why can't we make more progress? So where else has there been dramatic progress? What other issues? have had dramatic progress. Where else can we see dramatic progress in our society or around the world? What do you think? Gay and lesbians. Oh, great. Think about gay rights. 60 years ago, you couldn't be openly gay in San Francisco. Today, you can be openly gay in the Marine Corps. It's a pretty big change, right? Where else? Has there been some dramatic change? Let me give you a couple of examples of really dramatic change. So here's an idea. If you go back in time 500 years, practically nobody in the world believed this. Today, 99.999% of Americans believe this today. The idea that white people are all the same race. If you were to go back a few hundred years, British people would talk about how the Irish are a separate subhuman race. And some British would call the Irish white, white chimpanzees. And some British people would talk about killing off the Irish. In fact, there were many British people who tried to kill off the Irish. In fact, under English law, if you were British, you could rape or murder an Irish person. And because that person was Irish, you would not be punished. So what would happen if an American politician were running for president in 2016, and on national television, he or she were to say that the Irish are subhuman, they're chimpanzees. Our country would be better if all the Irish were gone. 
and the Irish should not be protected under American law from being raped and murdered. How would the American public react to that? Would that person win the election? Now, that person wouldn't just lose the election today. That person would sound completely insane today, right? Think about Bill O'Reilly, Irish Catholic. Stephen Colbert, Irish Catholic. People might not agree with their political viewpoint, but nobody today cares that they're Irish, right? Now, it wasn't just being Irish. If you go back 500 years, people didn't believe everybody in France was the same race. People didn't believe everybody in the region that became Germany was the same race. So attitudes have changed on that pretty dramatically. Here's another thing. 200 years ago in America, women could not vote, own property, or go to college. And women were viewed as intellectually and morally inferior to men. And now is a justification used for the oppression of women. So if you go back 200 years, women could not vote anywhere in the world. By 1970, women could vote in over 100 countries. Now, we don't have women's rights everywhere today. But wherever you find a lack of women's rights today, you find a women's rights movement. There is a women's rights movement today in Afghanistan. There is a women's rights movement today in Pakistan. There is a women's rights movement today in Saudi Arabia. If you go back 200 years, there was not a single women's rights movement anywhere in the world asking for full political, social, economic equality. It didn't exist anywhere 200 years ago. Now they're everywhere, right? So what would happen if an American politician were running for president in 2016 and on national television, he were to say that women are intellectually and morally inferior to men, and women should not be allowed to vote, own property, or go to college. How would the American public react to that? How would Sarah Palin react to that? <laughs> How would Michelle Bachman or Condoleezza Rice or Joni Ernst react to that? I think both parties would denounce that position, right? I don't think President Obama or President Bush would appreciate you saying their daughters cannot go to college. If you go back 200 years, less than 1% of the American population thought women should have the right to vote. People weren't even talking about that back then. In the 1830s and 1840s, these women's rights activists, they would pass around a petition for women's right to own property, and they would have trouble getting women to sign the document back then. So what would happen if an American politician were running for president in 2016, and on national television, he or she were to say that the reason why we're having a drought in California, the reason why we're having all this extreme weather, the reason why we have Ebola is because the gods are angry and we have to sacrifice a human being to please the gods. How would the American public react to that? That person win the election? Again, that person would sound insane today. Keep in mind, every major agricultural civilization practiced human sacrifice at one point in their history. The Greeks, the Romans, the Hebrews, the Aztecs, the Mayans, the Carthaginians, they also practiced animal sacrifice as a matter of government policy. What would happen if an American politician were running for president in 2016 and on national television, he or she were to say that the sun goes around the earth and people who don't believe that should be tortured and executed? How would the American public react? Would that person win the election? Of course not, right? And again, that person would sound insane to people living today. Now, the reason I'm mentioning all of this is there are only two possibilities that we can consider. The first possibility is that we are right today about every single issue, which has never before happened in human history. The second possibility is that we today are really, really, really wrong about certain issues. The second possibility is that we today are so wrong about certain issues that people in the future will look at us the way we look at people who thought the Irish were subhuman, the way we look at people who supported slavery, the way we look at people who practice human sacrifice, even the way we look at people today who oppose the civil rights movement. So what seems more likely? We're right about everything, or there are some issues we're really, really wrong about? So what are some of the issues we might be wrong about today? What might we be wrong about today? What issues are we mistaken about? What do you think? Anything come to mind? Oh, great. Think about gay rights, right? Great. What else? Oh, racism. Great. Still. Exactly, right? Keep in mind, many of the people who 
opposed to civil rights are still living, right? That wasn't that long ago. Interracial marriage wasn't legal in all U.S. states until the late 1960s. So we've made progress, but we have a lot more progress to make. Anything else? Oh, climate change. Great. Hey, good, yeah, good, good example. These are all great examples. <coughs> now keep in mind, the issues that we're really, really wrong about are not yet issues. If we're really, really wrong about it, it's not being debated yet. Let me give you an example of that. Women's right to vote is an issue in 1870. It's not an issue in 1270. If you go back to 1270, we don't know of anyone back then who was talking about women's right to vote is a major issue. Right? It wasn't really being discussed the way it was in the 19th century. Ending all state-sanctioned slavery is an issue in 1850. It's not an issue in the 5th century BC. We don't know of anyone in the 5th century BC who even conceived of the idea that you could end all slavery. Democracy is an issue in the 5th century BC. If you go back to the 5th century BC in ancient Athens and ancient Greece, people are debating democracy, talking about democracy. The benefits, the positive aspects, the negative aspects of democracy. But democracy is not an issue in the 12th century BC. If you go back to the 12th century BC, we don't know of anyone who even conceived of the idea that you could have a form of government to rule hundreds of thousands or millions of people other than the monarchy. So what if some of the biggest problems we have today are not yet even issues? Let me give you an example. Would all of you agree that two of the biggest problems in human history have been racism and sexism? Right? Did you know that there was, for example, go back 2,000 years. Was there racism 2,000 years ago? Absolutely. Was there sexism 2,000 years ago? Absolutely. But did you know that there was no word in the English language for racism until around the 1930s? And there was no word in the English language for sexism until the 1960s. So if you go back 200 years, people have no concept of what racism is. You can't explain to them what that means. Even though it is a problem, people are not aware of what it means. So if you were to go back to 1830 or 1840, and you were to talk to Ralph Waldo Emerson, and if you were to call him a racist, he would say, what does that mean? And he would say, well, you think the Irish are subhuman? He'd say, of course they're subhuman. They're Irish, right? So people would have no concept of what this problem is, even though it is a problem. Today, racism and sexism, common knowledge. People use that word every day, right? But 200 years ago, it wasn't really a concept. For people. So what if some of the biggest problems we have today are problems that we don't even have words for? Something very humbling to think about. And keep in mind, racism based on skin color is less than 500 years old. Right? Racism historically was not based on skin color. It was based on location. So most racism in human history was toward people who looked just like you. Think about the British and the Irish, the French and the Germans, the Greeks and the non-Greeks, the Koreans and the Japanese. Even in modern times, the Tutsis and the Hutu in Rwanda, they look the same, right? And if you go that back to the ancient world, racism had less to do with skin color, it had more to do with location. And then this invention of the white race came about, which made it based primarily on skin color, which is what we think of as racism today. Think about Jews, right? Jews, they look like Europeans, they look like people from the Middle East. You can't tell them apart that easily. And most racism in human history is based on location and not primarily on racial distinction. Distinction. But that is the predominant form of racism today is based more on skin color. Now, something I have to emphasize that I cannot emphasize enough is that the people who lived before us were not stupid people, and these were not crazy people. Many of these were very, very smart people. So I want to give you an example of how an idea that to us is common sense. If you go back in time, this idea makes no sense. So imagine going back 500 years and try and convince people that the Earth goes around the sun. Would that be an easier, hard thing to do? It'd be nearly impossible, right? Because if the Earth goes around the sun, why don't you feel a sense of motion? Why don't you feel anything moving? Why aren't buildings falling over? And if you look up, it looks like everything's moving around you. Even in the 21st century, we'll, we still say the sun rises and the sun sets. The sun doesn't rise or set. It's an illusion, but we still say that today. 
Now, if you're in a merry-go-round, and the merry-go-round is spinning around really quickly, what happens if you let go? Go flying off the merry-go-round. So the Earth is rotating at around 1,000 miles an hour. Why don't people go flying off the face of the Earth? So imagine going back 500 years and telling people not only is the Earth going around the sun, but the Earth is spinning like a top. People will say, you're crazy. I have physical proof the Earth is not moving. Look, it's not moving. I can see everything move around me, right? So what would you possibly tell people back then? Knowing everything you know today, to convince them that the Earth goes around the sun. What would you tell them? Gravity. That's a great point. I'm glad you brought up gravity. Think about what that would be like to go back in time and talk about gravity. Would people have any idea what you're talking about? Let me give you an example. So Galileo thought that he had figured out why we had the tide. He thought that he had figured out why we had the high tide and the low tide. He thought that it was because the Earth is moving and it's causing the water to slosh around, right? Imagine if you had a cup and you move a cup of water around, the water sloshes around, right? You move a cup around. So Gandhi, or uh, sorry, Galileo, <laughs> Gandhi's later in the discussion. Galileo thought that the reason why we have the tides is because the Earth is moving, it's causing the water to move. And Johannes Kepler said, actually, the reason why we have the tides is because the moon must be exerting some sort of invisible force and pulling upon the Earth and pulling the water out. Pulling upon the water, the moon must be exerting some sort of invisible force. And Galileo thought that that was the stupidest thing he'd ever heard. So Johannes Kepler is talking about gravity, and Galileo cannot comprehend it. Galileo thinks it sounds like magic, like sorcery, some sort of invisible magical force pulling on the water of the earth, some sort of invisible magical force. Sounds like sorcery, right? So Kepler is describing gravity, and Galileo can't understand it. So you would have a hard time explaining gravity to Galileo back then, let alone the average person. Isaac Newton's big realization was that the same force that causes the apple to fall to the ground is the same force that causes the Earth to go around the sun. That's a really revolutionary idea, that what causes the apple to fall down is the same force that causes the Earth to go around the sun, that causes the moon to go around the Earth. So you would have a hard time explaining gravity to Galileo back then, let alone to the average person. And what I'm trying to show here is these were very smart people. There's a lot of information we just take for granted that very intelligent people back then did not have access to. And if we had more time, I could put you in the mindset of somebody who practices human sacrifice. I could put you in the mindset of somebody who supports slavery. And I could show you how a perfectly intelligent human being can believe that based off what they know about the world and how that information is filtered through their worldview. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is just because people today disagree with us, we cannot assume they're stupid and crazy. That oversimplifies the problem. We have to think about what information do they have available to them and how was that information filtered through their worldview. For example, I used to be ultra conservative. I used to be a little bit to the right of Rush Limbaugh when I was a teenager. I was very pro-war. But my attitude has changed based off new information, based off some change in how I see things. And I think that if we assume that everyone is stupid or crazy just because they disagree with us, we're oversimplifying the problem, and we're robbing ourselves of an opportunity to try to reach out to these people and to try to persuade them. So I want to talk today about one issue, one problem that I think we have, that we have no word for, that is a huge problem, I think. But we really have no word for what this problem is today, even though it is a dramatic, serious problem. So imagine if you were to go back to the 12th century BC. This is the time period of the Iliad, right, where the Iliad supposedly took place in ancient Greece. And in the time period where the Iliad took place, nobody knows how to read. The kings don't know how to read, right? And reading is not even considered important. They don't understand why when you have to know how to read, right? So imagine if you were to go back to the 12th, 12th century BC and talk to people about illiteracy. Would they know what you're talking about? Would they know what that means? Because keep in mind, the term illiteracy, it has a negative connotation, right? 
It assumes that literacy is good, that illiteracy is bad. We know that today. We know that literacy is important. It's the bedrock, the foundation of education. We know that today because there is a reason why slave owners made it illegal for slaves to learn how to read and write. There's a reason for that. There is a reason why dictators ban books. There is a reason why the Nazis burn books. Books, reading, are powerful for liberating your mind from oppression. If you are an oppressor, it is physically impossible for a few people to control millions of people. You first have to oppress their minds. You first have to control how they think. And reading, writing, literacy, it can be used for propaganda, but it can also be used to liberate your mind from ignorance. And this is why it was illegal for slaves to learn how to read and write, and why dictators, a lot of books they don't like because they can challenge their position. So we know today that literacy is important. Illiteracy is a problem. And we know that literacy is the foundation of education, right? But if you go back to the 12th century, it would be very difficult to convince people back then why reading is important, because people have no reference point for why reading is important. Now, today, I think we have a kind of illiteracy that we're not really aware of, that is very dangerous. And we have this illiteracy of what it means to be human. We have this illiteracy today of the human condition. We have this literacy of human nature, of what it means to be human, that makes us very easy to manipulate. And I want to talk about this illiteracy. So to go into more depth, what are some examples of art forms? Music, anybody here playing instrument? Painting, <coughs> sculpting, acting, filmmaking is an art form. <coughs> Cooking can be an art form, right? I think sports are art forms. I think if you play baseball, basketball, soccer, if you want to do that well, you have to hone your craft. You have to treat what you're doing like an art, where you have to train, hone your craft. Think about martial arts, right? Sports, music, sculpting, painting, visual arts, these are all art forms where you have to train. Now, there is something that the Roman philosopher Seneca called the most difficult art form. The Roman philosopher Seneca said that there is an art form no, more difficult than any instrument, <coughs> any athletic activity, any visual art. What did he call the most difficult art form? He said the art of living. The art of living is where you are both the sculptor and the sculpture. Living is the most difficult art form. How to live. And the Roman philosopher Seneca said throughout the whole of life you must learn how to live. And what will amaze you even more, throughout the whole of life, you must learn how to die. Now think about the art of living, right? As a child, I was never taught how to overcome fear. That is probably one of the most important life skills you can have. How do you overcome fear? I was never taught that as a child. How to overcome frustration. How to overcome adversity. How to resolve conflicts. How to calm yourself down. That's a pretty important life skill, how to calm yourself down. I was never taught that as a child. How to calm other people down. That's a pretty important life skill, right? How to listen, how to be a good friend. Basic life skills that we're just not taught that are really critical to being human. Life skills that we could use in daily life, conflicts with roommates, with friends, with family members. We're not taught how to deal with these kinds of things. How to overcome hatred, how to build empathy, how to build courage. Basic life skills were not taught. And it creates a lot of problems. Imagine if you had a basketball game, and you have all the basketball players, and they were never taught how to play basketball. It'd be kind of a mess, right? Imagine if you had an orchestra, and none of the players had been taught how to play their instruments, and you had them play Beethoven. It's going to be kind of a mess, right? So if you have millions of people living together, and we're not taught how to live, it's going to be kind of a mess, right? We might learn some things from our parents, but many people don't learn good skills from their parents. Many people learn very destructive forms of conflict resolution from their parents. And many people might learn some good techniques from their parents, but learn bad things from the media or from society. So I want to talk today about how basic knowledge about what it means to be human, the human condition, human nature, can really help us live, make it harder for us to be manipulated, help us move through the world more effectively, and give us some tools we can use to be more effective in our lives. 
So the first thing I want to talk about regarding what it is to be human is what's a phobia? An irrational fear, right? What are examples of phobias? Fear of spiders, fear of snakes, fear of heights, fear of closed spaces. About 15% of people are afraid of snakes. But there is something that Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman calls the universal human phobia. There is something that 98% of human beings have a phobia of. Can you guess what it is? Death is a good answer, but this is a bigger fear than death. 98% of us have this, and I think we need to know what it is, right? 98% of people have a phobia of what? Public speaking is a great answer. <laughs> public speaking is actually the right answer because the reason why public speaking is terrifying is because of this other phobia. 98% of human beings have a phobia of human aggression directed at them. Interpersonal human aggression terrifies most people. And I'm going to explain how this is a bigger fear than death. So every year in America, tens of thousands of people die in car wrecks. Very, very tragic. But every year, every year in America, tens of thousands of people die in car wrecks. Very, very tragic. But every day, millions of people casually drive without a warrior care in their world. Every year in America, hundreds of thousands of people die from the effects of smoking. Very, very tragic. But every day, millions of people casually smoke without a warrior care in the world, knowing the risk. But if there is one serial killer in a town, and that serial killer kills a few people, the whole town can go upside down. One mass shooting in America, the whole country can go upside down, can grab the whole country's attention, can dramatically alter a way of life. One terrorist attack in America, right? Whole country goes upside down, it can dramatically alter a way of life. Now, 3,000 people die every couple months in car wrecks, why do car wrecks not dramatically alter our way of life the way that terrorism does? You think about September 11th, a very, very tragic event. 3,000 people died. But if that many people die every couple months in car wrecks, why do car wrecks not alter our way of life the way that terrorism does? Why do car wrecks not get our attention the way that a mass shooting or a serial killer does? So I read an article in The Atlantic that said that after September 11th until today, if you are an American citizen, you are as likely to be killed by your furniture as by a terrorist. You're as likely to die because your furniture falls on top of you than to be killed by a terrorist. So in 2010, globally, 15 American citizens were killed by terrorists. In 2011, globally, 17 American citizens were killed by terrorists. If you were to multiply that number by 1,000, let's say that one year, 15,000 American citizens were killed by terrorism, that would still be less than half the number of people killed every year in car wrecks. Now, I'm not trying to minimize that loss of life. 15 dead Americans is very, very tragic to those families. But I am showing that we have a irrational fear. If you look at these statistics, we have this irrational fear that enables us to be manipulated, right? So why are we not as afraid of car wrecks as we are of terrorism? What's different about car wrecks and terrorism? What's different about those two things? Pardon? Fear of smells. Huh? Oh, fear. Great. And what about the fear is different? Um, One of them is intentional, the other is not. The other is intentional, the other is not. Anything else? Control. Oh, great. Think about control. Think about what, that's a great, great point. Let's talk about whether it's about control. Great. We'll talk about all of these. These are great points. So think about control. Is it really about control? First of all, when you're driving, you don't really have control. You have control over your own vehicle, but you don't have control over the other drivers texting and driving or driving drunk or falling asleep at the wheel or being distracted. You only have control over your own vehicle. Now you might say, well, when you're driving, you have the illusion of control. But think about riding in a taxi. Right? You might have the illusion of control because you're holding the steering wheel, but think about riding the taxi. The most people have a phobia of riding in taxis. Or think about this. How many of you have been on a road trip, a long road trip, and you've been in the passenger seat and you've gone to sleep? Probably everyone in the room, right? Do you realize how dangerous that is? 
In the army, you're not allowed to sleep on a convoy if you're the passenger because if you're awake, you can help keep the driver awake and you have another pair of eyes to look at the road. But the most people have a phobia of sleeping as a passenger on a long road trip where you are completely giving up control. You might never wake up. You're going to sleep, maybe for two hours. The driver might kill you while you're sleeping. And the most people have a phobia of that where you are completely giving up control and you might not wake up. So there's something else going on. And let's talk about that, right? So here's two scenarios. I'm going to give you two scenarios, and you tell me which scenario is more traumatizing. The first scenario, you're riding your bike, you fall off your bike, you break your leg. The second scenario, you're riding your bike, a group of people grab you, hold you down, and break your leg with a baseball bat. Which is more traumatic? The second one, by a lot, right? But why? If you have the exact same physical injury, why does it matter how you broke your leg? If you have the exact same physical injury, why does it matter? What's different? Because a human being inflicted it upon you. Think about a natural disaster where you don't have control, right? Think about an earthquake, hurricane, tornado, wildfire, where you feel helpless. What is more traumatizing, being a black family in the South and having your house burned down by a wildfire, or being a black family in the South and having your house burned down by the KKK, right? When a human being does it to you, it's much more difficult to get over. Now, we are so vulnerable to human-induced trauma that a human being does not even have to physically touch you to traumatize you. A human being can betray you. They can humiliate you. They can bully you. They can verbally abuse you. They can call you a racial slur. They can spit in your face. They can spread malicious gossip about you. They can shun you, right? That is how vulnerable we are to human-induced trauma. I know many people who would rather break their leg in an accident than be betrayed by those closest to them. I know many people who would rather break their leg in an accident than be publicly humiliated, right? So we have this unconscious fear because when humans hurt us, it's hard to get over. It's like losing your wallet and having someone steal your wallet at gunpoint. Even though the physical outcome is the same, when a human being does it, especially out of malicious intent, it's harder to get over. This is why things like the Holocaust are very traumatizing to people, right? Things like torture and rape are very traumatizing to people because a human being did this to you. Now, this is why terrorism is so dangerous. The reason why terrorism is so dangerous is because of how we react to it. If Al-Qaeda would have said they wanted to spy on their own people and torture and betray our own values and bankrupt our economy partly through war spending, we would have never done that. But by attacking us, we willingly do that. And this is why people are afraid of public speaking. Because when you're doing public speaking, the worst case scenario is, what if I say the wrong thing and the audience becomes aggressive toward me? What if they laugh at me or humiliate me or verbally abuse me? or make fun of me, or judge me, right? People have this unconscious fear of humans psychologically hurting them. And that has a lot to do with the fear of public speaking, which, again, is an irrational fear. There's nothing to be afraid of, but people get nervous without a lot of experience or practice. Most people do, not everyone. Now, if you look at the whole gun control debate, right? This is why both sides of the gun control debate are so emotional. And they actually have a lot of common ground. So if you were to ask a anti-gun control person, I know many anti-gun control people. If you were to ask an anti-gun control person, why should you be allowed to have a gun? Many of them will say, I don't want a crazy person to shoot me and my family. If you were to ask a pro-gun control person, why should we restrict guns? Many of them will say, I don't want a crazy person to shoot me and my family. They have the same fear, right? but they react to the fear differently. Now, this enables us to be manipulated, right? If you think about war, these evil people want to come kill our family, right? And people don't react well to that. And we have this vulnerability to trauma that I think we have to recognize and understand how the human mind can be manipulated. And this is something that affects almost all people, how vulnerable and sensitive human beings really are. 
human beings are very vulnerable, sensitive creatures. We're very vulnerable. We're very psychologically sensitive. It's true. You might see some big, tough, macho guy with a bunch of tattoos riding a motorcycle, and you might think he's not sensitive. Go up to him and call him stupid to his face. Go up to him, call him a wimp. Say something bad about his mother. Spit on his, spit on his shoes, see how he reacts to you. They don't actually do that. <laughs> but humans are very sensitive. I react to this knowledge by dealing with people very gently and very compassionately. Realizing that human beings are very vulnerable, very sensitive, that inspires me to treat people very gently, very compassionately. And it allows me to recognize our shared humanity, that we have this vulnerability. And so it inspires me to treat people much more gently in my life. So here's something else. At West Point, I read a book called On Killing, written by Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. He was a West Point psychology professor and army ranger. And the premise of his book, On Killing, is that it is unnatural for human beings to kill other human beings. And we have a natural aversion to killing our own species. Now, this had countered everything I had been taught growing up. Growing up, killing seemed very easy watching Hollywood movies. But Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman says that we have an innate aversion to killing other humans. And the evidence for this, he says, is all of military history. All of military history supports this. So in order to wage war, how must you portray an opposing group of people in order to wage war against them. How must you portray an opposing group of people in order to wage war against them? As non-human, as non-human, as subhuman, as evil. And this is done through what Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman calls distance. And he talks about three kinds of distance. The first form of distance is psychological distance. Psychological distance means portraying people as subhuman. And this is often done through a derogatory name column. And then on killing, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman talks about how our own country has used derogatory name calling in war to portray people as subhuman. So what do we call the Germans when we fought them? We call them Krauts, Huns. Keep in mind there's multiple racial slurs for every ethnic group. What do we call the Japanese when we fought them? Japs. And it wasn't just name calling. In World War I, there was an official <coughs> British propaganda poster depicting a German soldier as a gorilla. In World War II, there was an official American government propaganda poster depicting a Japanese soldier as a rat. In World War II, there was an official Japanese government leaflet depicting a British soldier as a wolf. What do we call the people we're fighting now in the Middle East? When you turn on, the, when you turn on CNN, what word do you hear for people who are fighting in the Middle East? You hear insurgents. More commonly, you hear the word terrorist, right? And the word terrorist has a racial connotation. When Americans hear the word terrorist, the most Americans immediately think of a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Christian. They think of a Muslim, right? If a Muslim is in his own country fighting the US, we call that person a terrorist born insurgent. But think about the history of terrorism in the US. Have most terrorist acts in US history been committed by Muslims? Think about Timothy McVeigh. Think about the Unabomber. Did all of you know that in Birmingham, Alabama, in Birmingham, Alabama, that one city, between 1957 and 1963, 18 black churches and homes were bombed? During a two year time period in Mississippi, during the 1960s, in just two years, 50 black churches were bombed or burned. If you think about terrorism against African Americans, Native Americans, the Irish, even Italians, against Jews, any race can commit terrorism. But it has that racial connotation today. Now this goes way back in history. What did the ancient Greeks call all non-Greeks? They called them barbarians. Any of you know where the word barbarian came from? It was a way of making fun of how people talk. The Greeks believed that if you weren't speaking Greek, then when you talk, it sounded like you were saying bar, 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 bar. So they called those people barbarians. So making fun of how people talk is a subtle way to dehumanize them. Now, dehumanization can be very overt or it can be very subtle. Here's a very overt example of dehumanization. Have any of you seen the movie Hotel Rwanda? 
what did they call the people being massacred in Rwanda? They called them cockroaches. And I met a guy from Rwanda, he said they also called them snakes. So do you see how it's easier to kill people if you see them as cockroaches than if you see them as human beings? Now here's a very subtle example of dehumanization. Here's a very subtle example, collateral damage. What does collateral damage mean? When American politicians say collateral damage, what does that mean? It means you've killed civilians, women, children, right? Now, when American civilians are killed, do you ever hear an American politician call that collateral damage? Do you realize how offensive that would be to call a dead American collateral damage? But if they're a foreigner, we call that collateral damage. Here's another very subtle example of dehumanization, illegal aliens or illegals. Very, very subtle in how it blocks your empathy for those people. Another subtle example of dehumanization, Akilah Shrills, he grew up in gangs, and he negotiated the peace treaty between the Bloods and the Crips. And he says the word gang member can be a very subtle form of dehumanization. Akilah Shrills says that if the local news, the evening news, were to say that two 13-year-old boys were killed, people would be outraged. But if the evening news says two gang members were killed, people go, oh, good, right? They probably deserve to die. So do you see, if you call somebody a 13-year-old boy versus a gang member, it can change how you're able to empathize with that person. These things can be very, very subtle in how they affect our ability to have empathy. Now, dehumanization is not just for killing people. It's also for hurting, enslaving, uh, oppressing people. Do you ever wonder why there are so many dehumanization words for African Americans or for Native Americans? Think about gay people, why there are dehumanization words for gay people. Think about how women are dehumanized as sex objects. It's much easier to hurt somebody if you don't see them as human, right? Every single war in history has had dehumanization often through overt political propaganda. It's much harder to hurt somebody if you see that person is like you or like your family. So if you dehumanize a black person, a Jewish person, a woman, a gay person, an Irish person, it's much easier to hurt that person. Second form of distance is moral distance. Moral distance means I'm good, you're evil, and God is on my side. This is what you typically see in a civil war. Civil wars, you might have the same language, customs, traditions. So civil wars are typically good versus evil, right? So civil war or moral distance, broadly speaking, is where you think, I'm good, you're evil. If I kill you, I'm expelling evil from the world, and God wants me to kill you. So what did you see prior to the Iraq invasion of 2003? Prior to the Iraq invasion in 2003, did you see more psychological distance for fighting subhuman? Or did you see more moral distance for fighting evil? What did you see prior to the Iraq invasion in 2000? You saw more moral distance for fighting evil. President Bush called them the axes of evil, and he called them evildoers, right? Now keep in mind, humanity is making progress. It is harder to dehumanize people now than it was 100 years ago. You can't have a poster today of a German soldier as a gorilla. Most people are not going to fall for that today. You can't have a poster today of a Japanese soldier as a rat. Most people will not fall for that today. So the propaganda has become much more sophisticated today. So prior to the Iraq invasion of 2003, American politicians would basically say, look, the Iraqi people are just like us. They are just like us. They want freedom. They want democracy. They want a better way of life. They want a brighter future for them and their children. And these poor suffering people are living under this evil dictator. And don't we have a moral obligation to liberate these poor suffering people from this evil dictator? And look at these Afghan women. They're just like our women. They're like our mothers, our daughters, our sisters, our wives. And these poor suffering women in Afghanistan, they want education. They want democracy. They want a brighter future for them and their children. And these poor suffering women are living under the evil Taliban. And don't we have a moral obligation to liberate these poor suffering women from the evil Taliban? Now, don't get me wrong. 
People have suffered terrible debtors, the doctor saying. People are suffering terribly under the Taliban. But the U.S. government supported Saddam Hussein through all his worst atrocities. We gave him the means to develop and deploy chemical weapons. After he committed those atrocities, we increased military aid to him. We talk about liberating the women of Afghanistan, who were currently allied with, with one of the most oppressive governments in the world toward women, the Saudi Arabian government. One of the most brutal dictatorships in the world is the Saudi Arabian government. They are one of our closest allies. ISIS cuts people's heads off. The Saudi Arabian government cuts people's heads off. And the Saudi Arabian government abuses women. They have a bad human rights record on treatment of women. So do you see a contradiction there, an obvious contradiction that makes us wonder what are the US government's real intentions in that region, when you see this very obvious contradiction? Third form of distance is mechanical distance. Mechanical distance means the farther away you are, the easier it is to kill people. The farther away you are, the easier it is to kill people. It's easier to kill people by dropping a bomb at 10,000 feet than it is to shoot them with a rifle at 300 yards, and that's easier than stabbing people with a knife at close range. So the farther away you are, the easier it is to kill people. Now, there are estimates that around 2% of the human population is psychotic, right? But many people have a difficult time killing at close range those who are not psychotic. So here's a question. Why did the Nazis use a gas chamber? Why do you think the Nazis used a gas chamber? Yes. Exactly, because you could not see the people being killed. It was harder to see the people being killed. There's a very common myth that the Nazis used a gas chamber because it was efficient. But there's really nothing more efficient than the firing squad. The firing squad is very efficient. And the Nazis killed nearly a million people with firing squad as their primary method of execution before switching to the gas chamber as their primary method. And one reason they switched was, if you look at the rationale of Heinrich Himmler or Adolf Eichmann or the Comet of Auschwitz, it was to protect the executioners. Because according to them, too many Nazi soldiers were becoming traumatized from killing women and children all day. You have that 2% that could be psychotic, but many of these Nazi soldiers, they're killing women and children. Many of these women and children might be German citizens. Some of them might be Christians who happen to have Jewish blood. And you're shooting them at close range, so you supplied them with blood, bone fragments, brains, and a lot of them had a hard time. So it was all about protecting the executioner. So when people are being executed, whether it's hanging, firing squad, electric chair, why are their faces almost always covered? Is it for their benefit? When Saddam Hussein was executed and his face was covered, were they doing that for his benefit? It's to protect the execution. Right? When someone's being killed via the electric chair, you don't want to see their eyeballs pop out of their head. And so it's all about protecting the executioner from trauma. It's harder, harder to kill people if you can see their face. Now here's the question. When people are being executed, whether it's lynching in the South, crucifixion in the Roman Empire, or ISIS cutting off the journalist's head, why are their faces not covered? To instill fear, exactly. Because they are using the execution as a terror weapon. Because they are trying to traumatize and terrorize you. So if the KKK lynches a black man in the South, they are trying to terrorize and traumatize the black population. They're not going to cover the person's face. When the Roman Empire crucifies a rebel, they are trying to terrorize and traumatize every potential rebel. They're not going to cover the person's face. ISIS is trying to terrorize and traumatize the American population. Does it work? It works pretty effectively throughout history. It's more terrorizing and traumatizing if you see someone like you or a member of your community killed and their faces revealed. It's a very effective terror weapon throughout human history. Now, mechanical distance. Mechanical distance. This is why you so often see road rage, and you so very rarely see sidewalk rage. Think about walking on the sidewalk. You're bumping into people. It's New York City. It's very crowded. You're getting in the subway. You're getting on the Tokyo subway. 
people do not become enraged with nearly the frequency when they're walking as when they're driving. Because when you're driving, this big machine cuts you off. You can't see the person's face. All you see is a middle finger pop up. And it makes you angry, right? Now, imagine if every child in the world was taught how dehumanization works. It's like a magic trick. If you don't know how the magic trick is done, it's much easier to be fooled. If you know how the trick is done, you can see through the illusion. So if you don't know how they do the trick, you can be fooled by it. But if somebody says, here is how you do this magic trick, it's much easier to see through the illusion. Imagine if every child was taught, here is how the illusion is performed. Right? Think about how much harder it would to be to manipulate any population of people. I gave this talk a couple days ago. And this woman, she had an exchange student from China stay with her. And the exchange student from China was reading about the US government's treatment of Native Americans. And this Chinese exchange student, she said, I, I cannot believe how badly the American government treated these Native Americans. It's so horrible what was done to the Native Americans. And the woman, she said, uh, and the student, she said, the way that the US government portrayed the Native Americans as subhuman and savages, I just can't believe how horrific that was. And the woman said, it's kind of like how the Chinese government treats the Tibetan people. And the exchange students, she said, well, the Tibetans are subhuman. And the woman said, you see what you just did, right? And immediately something clicked in the, the student's mind. And she realized that she was susceptible to the same thing that she was critical of, that she thought the Tibetans were subhuman. And she was able to make this connection in her mind that this technique was also being used to influence how she saw a large population of people. But imagine if every child was taught this. And this is not very complicated. And it affects everybody. It affects women, gay people, right? It might affect you because you have a certain, uh, the way your body looks, right? Black people, Hispanic people. It really affects a lot of people. So dehumanization is very relevant to our lives and how it makes it easier for people to hurt us. And how even you'll see cases where even poor people can be dehumanized. Right? Now, again, these are just basic things about being human, about the human condition, that it would be really good for us to know how the human mind works, how human nature works. The last thing I want to share with you today about that is something that you can apply to your lives in order to wage peace more effectively something that will help you with friends, family, strangers, coworkers, your boss, employees you might have. So a practical technique you can apply to your life that'll just help you better resolve conflict and even avoid conflict. And to talk about that technique, I have to share a story. So I have one friend I still talk to from high school. I grew up in Alabama. He still lives in Alabama. And I went to visit him four summers ago where he still lives in Alabama. So I went to visit him on a Friday. And him and his friends wanted to go out drinking that evening. I don't drink any alcohol, but I went out with them anyway just to be social. And at around 2 in the morning, they all wanted to go to a Waffle House. Everybody was drunk. And in Alabama, that's where drunk people go when they're hungry at 2 in the morning. So we go to this Waffle House at 2 in the morning. I'm probably the only person in the Waffle House who wasn't drunk other than the workers. And there's a guy in the corner just screaming at this waitress. He's screaming at this waitress because she just brought him his food, and he has a dirty fork. And he's screaming at her. My fork's dirty. My fork's dirty. Give me a clean fork. I want a clean fork. She doesn't have a clean fork for him immediately. So he walks across the Waffle House, takes my fork out right in front of me, goes back, sits down, starts eating. So I'm looking at the menu. I haven't ordered any food yet. The waitress saw what happened, and within 30 seconds, she gave me a brand new fork. So I'm not too worried about it. Now my friend's friend is sitting next to me, and he gets really, really angry. He goes, that guy just took your fork. <laughs> and I go, yeah, but now he has a fork, I have a fork, everybody has forks, everything's fine. So my friend's friend is getting angrier, angrier, angrier. I said, look. I appreciate you trying to defend my honor. <laughs> the guy didn't take my wallet. If he took my wallet, I'd have to go get my wallet back. And what he did was wrong. He should not have taken my fork. 
But when people are that drunk, they make really bad decisions, and you can't reason with them. So he didn't take my wallet. He's over there eating his food. He's not bothering anybody right now. I think we should just leave the guy alone. So my friend's friend is getting angrier, angrier, angrier. Finally, he goes, I'm not going to take this. <laughs> he goes over and starts screaming in the guy's face. He goes, he's a veteran. You can't take his fork. So I haven't drunk any alcohol, so I'm looking at everything very rationally. <laughs> and first of all, the guy who took my fork is physically massive. <laughs> a very large, muscular human being. And I've done martial arts for a long time. Martial arts teaches just because people are big doesn't mean they can fight. But it is something to think about. <laughs> so it's a pretty dangerous situation. There's four men. They're all at the table together. They're all large, big men. The guy sitting next to the guy who took my chain, the guy sitting next to him, uh, the, the guy sitting next to the guy who took my fork, he has a big chain around his neck, like a Home Depot chain. <laughs> And there's two other men, I swear to you, these two other men, they're tall, muscular, they're about six foot four, and they're wearing cowboy boots, cut off short, short jeans, tank tops, and women's wigs. Very interesting group. <laughs> now I am being completely sincere when I say this. I'm being completely sincere when I say this. For me, it was a very interesting moment of hope because the guy who took my fork was black, a clean cut looking black guy. The guy with the chain was white. There were two white men dressed up like women. And you wouldn't have seen that at a restaurant in Alabama six years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so I realized there's going to be a fight. I go over there. I calm my friend's friend down. I bring him back. And the guy with the chain <coughs> comes over and apologizes. He goes, I'm really sorry. My friend's drunk. Doesn't know what he's doing. Let me apologize by paying for your meal. Now, the reason I tell you that story is because there was almost a mini war started just over people feeling disrespected. That's all that, that was about, was people feeling disrespected. Everybody had food. Everybody had forks. Nobody's personal property was taken. That was all about people feeling disrespected. My friend's friend was disrespected because my fork was taken, and that guy was disrespected because he's being yelled at. Now, there is a reason why martial arts teaches you to always respect everybody, including your opponent. The reason why martial arts teaches you to always respect everybody, including your opponent, is the vast majority of human conflict comes from people just feeling disrespected. That is what causes most human conflict, is people feeling disrespected. Think about the times in your life when you most wanted to punch somebody in the face. Probably because you felt disrespected, right? That probably had something to do with that very strong emotion. So martial arts teaches the best self-defense is not punching or kicking. The best self-defense is to go through life conveying respect to everybody. If you convey respect to everybody, you not only dramatically reduce conflict in your life, you also dramatically improve your ability to resolve conflict. Because conflict will eventually happen. And it makes it much easier to resolve conflict if you convey respect. This is a very basic life skill that can improve all kinds of human relationships. But we're not really taught how to convey respect. And we're not even really taught what causes conflict, when so much of conflict is caused by simple disrespect. Now, this is why we admire Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, and Gary Mackay, is they respected everybody, even their opponents. That is what gave them so much moral authority, right? Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., they had no official authority. Gandhi wasn't a president. He wasn't a general. Why did people follow him? Part of it is he had so much moral authority and his ability to convey respect. We admire Nelson Mandela because he even respected his prison guard. We admire Martin Luther King Jr. because he even respected the white oppressor. What if there had been a picture of Martin Luther King Jr. flipping off a bunch of white people? Can you imagine how that would have hurt his credibility? How that would have hurt his moral authority? How that would have hurt his entire movement? Now, how do we convey respect? How do we do that? I write about that. It's a complicated topic. I just want to share one thing, one thing that every culture finds respectful. All right? So one thing that every culture finds respectful is listening. Every culture in human history finds listening respectful. Every culture finds not listening disrespectful. Think of it like this. 
in all of human history, in all of human history, I don't think anyone has ever seriously said, I hate it when people listen to me. I can't stand it when people listen to me. Right? No one ever says, me and my spouse have to go to marriage counseling. My spouse listens to me all the time. I can't take it anymore. Right? Everybody likes to be listened to. Now, the key to listening is empathy. If you don't empathize with people, you can't really hear what they're saying. If you don't empathize with them, you can hear their words, but you can't hear their hopes, their fears. You can't hear their humanity. So the key to listening is empathy. Empathy allows you to hear people at the deepest level possible. Empathy gives you the deepest insight into another human being. Now, what percent of the American population actively participated in the women's rights movement or the civil rights movement? Less than 1% of people actively participated. Right? This is the other 1%. And those, those people were very well trained. We have to be very active because the issues we're dealing with now, nuclear weapons, war, environmental destruction, these issues threaten human survival today. We have to be very active. These skills, these techniques I'm talking about are helpful not just for personal life, they're also critical for trying to make the world better and create the future needed for humanity's survival. So this is just a little bit of information. And these are all things that I think all of you know. You might not know you know it, but you know it unconsciously, right? We all know what is most traumatizing when you really think about it. But bringing that to your conscious awareness and revealing how that can be used to manipulate people, and how we can use those techniques to create a better world is really critical in this era. Getting this literacy today in the human condition, human nature, what it means to be human, and the art of living. So thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, I'd be glad to discuss them. Thank you. Questions? How much more time do we have? About 15, 20 minutes. Okay, so any questions? And if you would, if you're going to ask questions, we'd like you to use the mic so that we can record. As long as I'm sitting by the mic. Um, so, what do you say to people who say uh, the human condition is really warring, that violence is, is natural? and that we're never going to stop warfare because human nature is warring. A great question. That's a lot of what I write about. In my longer talk, I address the myth that we're naturally violent. And I'd like to begin with how much attitudes have changed, because people thought, well, slavery is natural. Black people are naturally subhuman. And people believe that for many, many years. People thought that women are naturally intellectually, morally inferior to men. Men have always ruled. Men should always rule. Women should never have equal rights to men, right? And think about attitudes toward human sacrifice, animal sacrifice. Think about attitudes toward monarchy, right? Democracy used to be very controversial, even when Thomas Paine was writing. Thomas Paine and Common Sense had their explain that democracy is not going against God, because people believe that God chooses the king. And people thought, well, if you're talking about democracy, you're opposing God. And so democracy used to be very controversial. People thought that the king is chosen by God, so democracy sounds sacrilegious. The amount of evidence that we're not actually violent is just overwhelming. Now, what I'm saying here is that violence has causes, preventable causes. I'm not saying people can't become violent. People can become extremely violent. But violence has causes. So my father fought in the Korean and Vietnam War. So he had a lot of war trauma. I grew up in a very violent household. I was bullied as a child, partly because of how I looked. And I grew up with a, with a really violent temper. And I got kicked out of elementary school for fighting. I got suspended in high school for fighting. And what really drew me to interest in peace was trying to control my own rage. I realized as a teenager that I just do not get angry the way most people get angry. My capacity for rage exceeds most other people. And if I do not figure out how to control my temper, I'm going to kill somebody someday or I'm going to kill myself at some point. Now, I wasn't born that way. I was conditioned to be that way through a very violent upbringing. 
If you look at the violent criminal population, the vast majority of people in the violent criminal population have some sort of childhood trauma, some sort of childhood abuse. So I'm not saying that people can't become violent, but things, that, things like trauma, bullying, abuse, alienation, poverty, right, despair, these things increase people's propensity for violence. And we can work to reduce these preventable causes to make our society more peaceful. We may never get rid of all violence, right? Let's say that one out of a thousand people is going to be violent as a repeat offender. One out of a thousand. If you have a community of 800 people, that's not a big deal. If you have a community of a thousand people, the other 999 people can control that one person. But if you have a community of 300 million people, and one out of a thousand is going to be a repeat violent offender, that's 300,000 violent people. You have to have some kind of law enforcement. I am not at all arguing for prohibition, but as long as we have alcohol in the world, we will have to have some kind of law enforcement. Because when people are drunk, many people who are drunk are more likely to become violent. If you look at the correlation between people being drunk and violent crime. But we can reduce those numbers. We can, I'd much rather live in a country with 2,000 murders a year rather than 30,000 murders a year, right? We can reduce the numbers of murder rate, serial killer. It might never be zero, but we can make significant progress. I think war is a different system because war requires so much public support. It requires high-tech weaponry. It requires the popular will in many cases. It requires enormous resources, enormous tax dollars. It requires propaganda. So I could see a future we, we, where we could end politically organized violence between countries and where we could we could dramatically reduce domestic violence. Maybe never to zero, but I think we could make a lot of progress if we were to move forward in how we understand what it is to be human and how do we wage peace effectively and how do we productively <coughs> solve these problems in ways of the violence. Just to give you one example, right? War traumatizes the brain. If human beings were naturally violent, why would war traumatize the brain? If human beings were naturally violent, wouldn't people go to war and become more mentally healthy? But the opposite happens. If you raise a child in a peaceful, loving environment that is good for the human brain, that is good for human development, scientific fact. If you raise a child in a violent, abusive environment that is not good for the human brain, that is not good for human development, scientific fact. But if you're naturally violent, why wouldn't the opposite be, be true? So just a couple things to think about. Um, the, I'm in the army, and the longer, and as I've been getting educated, and the longer I stay, and I realize a lot of things I do contrast with what I believe. And do you believe that there's a way within the military to change the system, or does that have to come from outside force? Oh, great. I think both. I think if you look at desegregating the military, that was internal and external pressure. I think that. If you look at don't, re repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell, there was a lot of external pressure on that. But there was also a survey done with US military personnel. And the majority of people in the survey said that they thought that repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell would either have no effect or a positive effect on the military. So I think it's typically a combination. It's applying inward pressure and outward pressure. So I think both are, are typically. Another question here across the room. Um, I, too, grew up in Alabama, so I experienced pretty much the same teasing, same lifestyle that you did. And I went to the military, got married. My wife was Italian. And so it was interesting. We'd go home and go to the local mall. And it was just like, people were just like stare. It's like, like, I mean, it's like we was like, animals or like demons or something. It's just like, and it just became a time, I don't know, it was like over the years of going home every year. We went home one time and it was just like a switch. We go to the mall and it's like, no one was staring at us. And it was, I don't know, it was just overnight, no one cared. And you see all these different races and cultures and all these different um, languages being spoken, which, you know, you didn't have that. I didn't have any Asian kids in my high school. 
None. No gay. Uh, I think my senior year, one kid came out, he was gay, and it wasn't a big deal to me, but it was crazy. I was only black in my class. So my question to you, when was it that you felt that time had just like, that, that switch had happened? That's a great question. For me, it was when I went to the Army, and that was the first time I would openly tell people I was part black. And I told this one guy from the South, he goes, that's a cool racial background. And I felt like I was on a different planet. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, it, was, it was bizarre, it was surreal. And because my father had just drilled into my brain. And my father was telling me his reality. He goes, look, he goes, you're, you look Asian, yeah. and you're part black. And keep in mind, being multiracial, the black community didn't like that my father had married a Korean woman. Korean people didn't like that my mother had married a black man. White people, I don't look white. And it was just like being on a different planet. And there are still certainly problems, but I just think that these are things that my father just could have never imagined growing up. And I just try to imagine a future where 2114 is as dramatically different to today as 1914 is to the present time. And I think we can make that future happen if we do the right thing. So that's just a great story. I really appreciate that. I'm very hopeful. Another question? Um, more looking at like your thoughts on war and like the bigger spectrum of peace in that way. Like what do you think about like the future and nuclear weapons? Oh, nuclear weapons, great question. So nuclear weapons are a great topic because they threaten human survival. And I think that the whole justification for nuclear weapons, any kind of injustice requires a justification, a rationalization. So the justification for slavery of African Americans was that these people are born to be slaves, they're happy being slaves, God made them to be slaves. Once you counter that myth, the whole system begins to come apart. The myth for the oppression of women in the US was women are intellectually and morally inferior to men. Once you challenge that myth, the system begins to come apart, right? The myth is that being gay is a lifestyle choice, that nobody is born gay. If anybody is born gay, it becomes a human rights issue. Now, with nuclear weapons, a lot of that is the myth of nuclear deterrence, that nuclear deterrence makes us safe and protects us, that nuclear deterrence protects us from other countries. So nuclear deterrence is the idea that if we have a nuclear weapon, they have a nuclear weapon, you won't kill each other because it works as a deterrent. But the US government does not really believe in deterrence theory. Think of it like this. If the US government really believed in deterrence theory, why wouldn't we want every country in the world to have nuclear weapons? Why would we care if Iran had one nuclear weapon? If we really believe nuclear deterrence works, and we have thousands of nuclear weapons, why does it matter if Iran has one, right? So it shows the US government does not really believe it works. Because if they believed it worked, we wouldn't care if Iran had one. We would give every country 10 nuclear weapons, and we'd have world peace. That's how the theory, if you look at the theory to its logical conclusion, that is what you would conclude. Because deterrence theory assumes that you have rational actors. If you don't have rational actors, deterrence theory does not work. And so it makes you wonder, right? If we really believe in deterrence theory, why would we care if Iran had a nuclear weapon? I don't think. Iran should have a nuclear weapon, by the way. But going back to respect, another element of universal respect is leading by example, not being hypocritical. So there's a famous story of Gandhi where a woman came to Gandhi and she said, Gandhi, please help me. My son will stop eating sugar. Gandhi, please help me. My son will stop eating sugar. Gandhi told the woman, take your son home, bring him back to me eight days later. The woman took her son home, brought him back to Gandhi eight days later, and Gandhi said, stop eating sugar. That was it. Woman was very confused. She said, Gandhi, why did you make me go through all that trouble to take my son home and bring him back to me eight days later? Why didn't you just tell him eight days ago to stop eating sugar? And Gandhi said, because eight days ago, I was still eating sugar. Right? So not being a hypocrite, right? If you're working for a boss and you're late to work one day, and your boss tells you to be on time, and your boss is late to work every day, it's gonna make you angry. 
You're going to say, who does he think he is to tell me to be on time? He's always late. When I was a kid and adults told me I couldn't curse and I would hear them curse, I'd say, why can't I curse, right? I hear them curse. So every culture can recognize hypocrisy. And every culture is angered by hypocrisy. If somebody gives you a lecture on being honest and they are the most dishonest person you know, it's going to make you angry. You're going to say, who do they think they are to lecture me, to preach to me on being honest when they're not honest themselves? So hypocrisy is a very major cause of disrespect. And leading by example is critical for leadership. If you are in the military, you learn the importance of leading by example, right? If you're an officer, if you're an uh, NCO, and you can't pass your PT test, if you're not on time, if your uniform's not squared away, and you criticize other people, you're a big hypocrite. No one's going to follow you. The most important thing for military leadership is leading by example. Never asking other people to do what you are unwilling to do yourself. So this is what Jesus talks about in the Bible. The man, the hypocrite, the man who has a log in his eye and criticizes the man who has a speck in his eye. Jesus says, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you can help your brother take the speck out of his eye. So think about the U.S. government. The U.S. government tells other countries, you can't have one nuclear weapon, and we can have thousands. You can't invade a country. We can if we want to, right? It causes disrespect, and the U.S. government could have so much moral authority, so much more moral authority, if it were to lead by example. So you see a kind of hypocrisy where it's very difficult for us to tell a country they cannot have a nuclear weapon if we have thousands especially if we've invaded both, both of those countries' neighbors and said that country is a part of the axis of evil, they're going to have possibly some motivation to want to protect themselves. So I really think that our country has to lead by example. And the hypocrisy of some of these politicians really bothers me, where I was raised to really believe in the American ideals. And to see politicians in power betray those values, it makes me upset. My mother really taught me the importance of citizenship, and I was in the military, and I just think that we have to hold our government accountable to live up to those ideals. Just like it made Frederick Douglass upset and Susan B. Anthony. They said, look at the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal, right? We've got to make our country live up to that. And they made a lot of progress. So I think just as we made progress domestically as a country, we can also make progress in terms of our foreign policy. Thank you. We are drawing toward the end of our time. I'd like to thank you. Uh, Paul Chappelle for the challenging questions and for hope. I, I, I have a website, peacefulrevolution.com, peacefulrevolution.com. If you want to email me or you want more information, I work for the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Our mission is to abolish nuclear weapons and power peace leaders. We have internships. We're in Santa Barbara. And if you'd like more information, PeaceRevolution.com. Thank you so much for listening. I'm very grateful, and, and thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. And just a final note, we've had an intern from our program, from Justice and Peace Studies, Tony Guadati, uh, studying with Paul, so that is a possibility for you would like to extend. On behalf of the Department of Justice and Peace Studies, thank you very much for coming, and thank you to Veterans for Peace for making this possible. Thank you all.